What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you're having a wonderful day. We're continuing on with the cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram like a boss series. And today we're gonna to be looking at our heart blocks. So to begin, we're gonna be looking at our first heart block, also known as first degree heart block. The rate is dependent on the underlying rhythm, but it's usually either sinus rhythm or sinus bradycardia. The rhythm will be regular, and P waves will be regular as they will precede the QRS complex. The main difference with a first degree heart block is the PR interval will be greater than 0.2 seconds and will be consistent. QRS intervals will be less than 0.12 seconds, which is normal, and the definition for this rhythm most commonly is caused by an increased delay at the level of the atrial ventricular node causing prolongation rather than a true block. So common causes for first degree heart block include hypoxemia, acute myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, chronic aortic regurgitation is a big one, acute myocarditis, hyperkalemia, hypo, thyroidism, digitalis toxicity, as well as beta blockers. There's not a whole lot that you're gonna do for a first degree heart block unless it is causing problems. So if oxygenation is inadequate, we can provide that oxygen to our patients, as well as atropine if the heart rate continuously keeps slowing down. To begin, we have atropine. That is our first drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardias. It can also be used in our AV nodal blocks. However, there really hasn't been shown any benefit to our second degree type two heart blocks as those are third degree complete heart blocks. You may still see it, but it just might not show benefit. So atropine dosing, 0.5 milligrams IV every three to five minutes, not to exceed 0.04 milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of three milligrams. Considerations for atropine, it can cause myocardial oxygen demand, so we have to be cautious if there is myocardial ischemia or hypoxia present when providing this to our patients. Lastly, it's important to note that atropine can cause paradoxal slowing. So sometimes instead of bringing the heart rate up, it can actually make it worse and slow it down further. So we need to prepare to pace these patients in case that paradoxal slowing does occur. Now with our second degree heart blocks, we've got two different types, type one and type two. Let's begin with looking at our second degree heart block, type one. So again, the rate is dependent on what the underlying rhythm is, and the rhythm will be irregular. P waves will be normal, and the PR interval lengthens progressively. So in this situation, you're gonna have a little bit of a length in PR interval, it's gonna lengthen again on our second beat, it's gonna lengthen again on your third beat, until eventually there's a drop in the QRS. The QRS, when it is there, will be normal, less than 0.12 seconds, and the definition again is the lengthening of the PR interval until the impulse is blocked, and the QRS drops in a repeating pattern. So causes with our second degree type one is gonna be hypoxemia, inferior wall myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, rheumatic fever, vagal stimulation is a big one, electrolyte disturbances, calcium channel blockers can cause this as well as digitalis toxicity and beta blockers. So interventions with our second degree type one heart block is oxygenation is always an option if oxygenation is inadequate. Atropine, if we have a slowing of the heart rate, and we might even consider temporary pacing based on the atropine either being effective or not. Talking about transcutaneous pacing, this is not fun for our patients, especially our conscious patients. So for unstable bradycardias that are less than 50 beats per minute with some kind of compromised hemodynamics. So what is that? That could be hypotension, acute altered mental status changes, shock, ischemic chest discomfort, as well as our acute heart failure patients. So what do we usually pace when we do transcutaneous pacing? Well, we do our symptomatic sinus node dysfunction rhythms, our type two second degree heart blocks, our third degree heart blocks, complete heart blocks, our new bundle branch patients that sh are showing slowing, as well as um, we're not using this for our agonal rhythms or our cardiac arrest. It shows no benefits. 
cardiopulmonary CPR, if it's shockable, we're gonna shock. If not, um, we're just gonna give medications and provide CPR. So transcutaneous precautions. Conscious paced patients may require analgesia for that pacing discomfort. Remember, this is uncomfortable for our patients when they're awake because they're constantly being shocked to provide that rhythm, um, to provide that upping of that rhythm for that patient. We also want to avoid palpating carotid pulses to confirm capture. Why do we do that? Because electrical impulses can cause muscle jerking that can mimic a pulse. So if you're checking a carotid pulse, that might not be accurate because of that constant muscle jerking caused by the transcutaneous pacing. So how do we set it up? We're gonna position the pacing pads on the patient as instructed by the packaging. Normally one pad goes over the right anterior chest wall and then the left pad will go on the left maxillary line next to the heart. We wanna turn on the pacer before we do anything else. And we wanna set the demand rate to 80 beats per minute or whatever the physician tells you to set it to. We also wanna set the current MA output. So an increased current starting with a minimum setting and moving on until electrical capture is consistent which would be a wide QRS and a T wave after each pacer spike, that means that our patient has ventricular pace, would be something that we want to see. Common current ranges between 50 to 80 MAs. Now we're gonna look at our second degree type two heart block. So the rate, the atrial rate is faster than the ventricular rate. The rhythm of course will be irregular and P waves will occasionally be conducted and occasionally won't. The PR interval, when there, will be consistent during conducted beats. So just like with our second degree type one, that PR interval is lengthening, 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 and then drops. Whereas with our second degree heart block type two, that PR interval will be consistent. QRS intervals are gonna be greater than 0.12 seconds usually. They're gonna be wide, they're gonna be ugly, they're gonna be gross. So the definition with our second degree heart block type two is a block within or below that atrial ventricular junction with a changing conduction ratio. PR intervals never change like we talked about before. And if it does progress, it can lead into a third degree complete heart block. So second degree type two heart block causes can be hypoxemia and anterior myocardial infarction and myocardial ischemia. Just like with our second degree type one, our second degree type two interventions will include oxygenation if oxygenation is inadequate, temporary pacing, and if it progresses into a more lethal rhythm, we need to call for assistance, provide the patient with cardiopulmonary resuscitation and follow our ACLS guidelines. If you need a review of what the ACLS guidelines are, I recently filmed an updated 2020 ACLS video. I'm gonna leave a link up here in the corner for your review. Lastly, we're moving on to that third degree complete heart block. This is not a very good rhythm. So the rate is usually different between the atria and the ventricles. The atrial rate will be between 60 to 100 beats per minute, but the ventricular rate is gonna be less than 40 beats per minute. And what do those ventricles do? They push that blood out to the body. If we're not getting that blood out to the body because of that slow rate, it's not gonna matter what our atria is doing, right? If we can't push it out effectively. So the rhythm, the atrial and ventricular rhythms are independently regular and are not gonna be associated with one another. So your R to R will be regular and your P to P will be regular, but they won't be talking to each other. Your players on your team are not conversing. So the P waves will be normal without relation to the QRS. There isn't a PR interval because they are not communicating with each other and the QRS interval really will vary. So the definition is a failure of the atria and ventricles to synchronize contraction. Regular P to P intervals and regular R to R intervals that do not match one another and the atrial rate is normal while the ventricular rate is Brady. So our third degree heart block causes can be hypoxemia, anterior or inferior wall myocardial infarctions, myocardial ischemia, cardiomyopathy, digitalis toxicity, as well as rheumatic fever. With the interventions with our third degree complete heart blocks, again, oxygenation, if oxygen is not adequate, 
We might want to consider temporary pacing if our patient is more stable. And if our patient becomes unstable and we lose a pulse, we're going to call for assistance, provide cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and we're going to follow those ACLS guidelines. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.